Donna. Um, you can tell which one of us is the more technologically dead. Jody's sitting here next to this computer and made certain that everything was working this morning. I'd like to introduce our three speakers today. I couldn't be more excited than um, to do this because I think this panel is a dynamic group. Um, the speakers are sitting here in order of how they are going to present. So Joanna Dolan, immediately to my left and your right, is Principal Research Analyst at the Kansas Legislative Research Department. She's been there since 2012. She's worked on ethics, elections, federal and state affairs, and redistricting. She holds a bachelor's degree in political science with an emphasis in American government from Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas, and a law degree from the University of Kansas. In the middle is Dagny Velasquez. She's an assistant professor of mathematics at Kansas City, Kansas Community College. She holds an undergraduate degree in chemical engineering, a master's of divinity, and a master's of mathematics. <laughs> an eclectic woman. Although her research has focused on applying concepts and not theory to the practice of aerial skills, she has recently looked for opportunities to apply her math skills in the political realm. And this summer, she attended the Geometry of Redistricting, a week-long intensive course created by the Metric Geometry and Gerrymandering Group at Tufts University. And she's going to share some of the insights she gained there about the intersection of law, math, and politics in the issue of gerrymandering. Tim Owens is a former Kansas State Senator representing the 8th District from 2008 to 2013. He was also a representative for the 19th District in the Kansas House of Representatives from 2002 until his election as Senator. From 1981 to 2005, he served as a council member for the Overland Park City Council 3rd District. But he's really here today because he was chair of the 2011 Special Committee on Redistricting. His work on this committee, among others, made him a target of the right of center, of center in Kansas politics. Senator Owens made national news as leading a moderate Republican in the, as a leading moderate Republican in the Kansas Senate, blocking the state's health care freedom amendment, an effort to push back parts of the Affordable Care Act, and arguing that judges should be selected by a committee of lawyers rather than exclusively by the governor. As a consequence, as a consequence of his independence, Owens and seven other moderates were targeted by um, in the primary election by Coke Industries in the 2012 elections, and Mr. Owens. Um, is therefore no longer in the Kansas Senate. <laughs> However, um, we were so proud of his work that the league gave him our Making Democracy Work Award, and we're very pleased to have him back today. We consider him a great friend of Lee. With that, we're going to start the presentation. <laughs> uh, as she said, I am Joanna Dolan from the Kansas Legislative Research Department. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. <I> <laughs> um, I'm Joanna Dolan from the Kansas Legislative Research Department, um, and I wanted to just say a word about our department before I got started with some background information on how we do redistricting in Kansas. Um, the Kansas Legislative Research Department was created in 1934. We are one of the nonpartisan agencies that staff the Kansas Legislature, um, providing nonpartisan policy research. Um, we also staff committees and write supplemental notes, which are the plain language summaries of the bills that you can find next to the copies of the bills on the website. Um, and then we also have uh, half of our office is fiscal analysts, and they uh, provide budget analysis for the executive agency's uh, budget. Um, we also provide services to the public, so if at any point in time any of you have questions, you're welcome to contact us. Uh, I staff elections 
redistricting and fed and state, but we have people who staff all of the committees and who know what's going on with bills or particular topics at any time and are more than happy to help you. We're a little bit slower during session just because we do have the legislators as our priority, but we're happy to help if you want to. Okay. Um, okay, so to start out with, what is redistricting? And that is a, a loaded question, but the dictionary definition of it is the process of drawing electoral district boundaries in the United States. And I'm sure, as most of you know, and the reason that we are here is because it's more complicated than that. Um, the Kansas legislature is responsible for drawing U.S. congressional district boundaries, as well as both the Kansas House and Kansas Senate district boundaries, and they also draw the state board of education boundaries. Uh, so why do we redistrict? And the short answer is because the law requires us to. Um, the Kansas Con or the U.S. Constitution requires a federal census every 10 years. So the federal law requires redistricting every 10 years based on that federal census. The Kansas Constitution requires the same for the state legislative districts. And when does the Kansas legislature redistrict? Well, we start with census, because census and redistricting go hand in hand. Census day is April 1st of 2020 this year, or this cycle. Um, we will have the data by April 1st of 2021, and we will redistrict in 2022. That's based on the Kansas Constitution. Um, and redistricting is truly a process that involves all three branches of government. We start with the census, the legislature draws maps, but then they go through the legislative process, which means that they are subject to veto by the governor. Uh, and then they have to go through court approval to make sure that they meet all the legal standards that they need to. <coughs> Like I said, it all starts with the federal census. Um, right now, we are in what is known as the Census Redistricting Data Program, and we are in phase two of that. I've listed the phases up here, but we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about them individually. Um, federal law requires that the states participate in this program through a nonpartisan liaison, and the Kansas Legislative Research Department serves as that liaison, so we talk with the Federal Bureau of Census to get information about um, updated boundary lines within the state communicated to the Census Bureau. Um, to do that, we coordinate with the Secretary of State's office since they are the chief election official and are responsible for certifying election information. Um, and we also coordinate with local officials to make sure that we have the correct information that we send to the Census Bureau. Um, phase one of that Census Redistricting Data Program this year, well, it, it, that's called the Block Boundary Suggestion Project. <laughs> um, that began in December of 2015 and ended in May of this year. The goal there is to allow the state and local governments to have input onto the block boundaries, which provides more meaningful uh, information to the state once the census is conducted. Um, block boundaries are kind of a, a foreign concept. The idea is in an urban area, it would be the size of a city block and you would get population information for that, for that small of an area. Um, it is basically what the precincts then should be built on. Um, and the underlying rule is that you're not supposed to break blocks when you redistrict. The legislature usually uses precincts as the building blocks for their district, but if you get into a situation where you're trying to meet the uh, standard deviation for districts, you can go down to the block level, and that's why it's important to have the population information on the block level. Um, I put up here some of the information on how census defines blocks as to what geography um, is used to delineate them, um, but it, the, the main idea is that it would be a, an urban city block. Um, and I was going to try and find the average population per block, but it varies widely because it, it is just it's literally a city block. Uh, phase two is what we are in now. Um, that invitation was sent out in the fall of this year. We're in the process of accepting that invitation and getting ready to participate. Um, the goal here is to update the voting precinct boundaries from the 2010 cycle 
to reflect the current precinct boundary. Um, if we, all of these are voluntary phases, since this does not require us to participate, but if we do not, we do not get precinct level data, county level would be the smallest we would get, and it's very hard to build districts with county level information. Um, so in phase three, um, we will get census data delivered to us by April 1st of 2021. Um, the Kansas Constitution does require an adjustment by the Secretary of State's office. We adjust both for our military and for college students. And we adjust not only to take those non-resident military and college students out of the county, but also to put resident military and college students back in the district of their residence. Um, and that uh, Secretary of State has until July 31st of the year ending at one to get that done. So July 31st of 2021 is when we have officially the numbers that we start using for the redistricting process. And four and five, I'm gonna go over really quickly because they're afterthoughts that happen after the redistricting process. The, in 2022, they will collect the final plans and then in phase five, they do a feedback evaluation and that gets published in 2025. All this is just to say that census and redistricting are truly an ongoing process. There's always something moving. Um, so it's important to, to pay attention to what's going on. Um, next is the process that how we actually redistrict. Um, like I said, all three branches of government are involved. Um, the legislature proposes and initially approves the maps. They go through the legislative process just like any other bill would which means that they are subject to the governor signing them, vetoing them, or letting them become law without a signature. Um, and then the Kansas Supreme Court does the final review to make sure that they meet the metrics and the legal standards that they are supposed to. And so how we did this, this I'm gonna shift a little bit back to how we did this in the last cycle in 2010, and physically in 2012. Um, they started with the redistricting advisory group, which was created by the Legislative Coordinating Council in 2009. The Legislative Coordinating Council is made up of legislative leadership um, from both the Republican and Democrat sides. Um, and the redistricting advisory group was made up of three senators and three representatives who assisted with the preparations and organization of redistricting. Um, I listed some questions that they might address, but basically they decide how we're going to go forward with this. So everything I say after this is historical because it could change, um, but this is historically how we have done it. Um, so after the redistricting advisory group got everything set up, we moved to the Joint Special Committee on Redistricting. Um, and that was made up of all of the members of the House Redistricting Committee and the Senate Reapportionment Committee. And during 2011, they held public hearings in 14 places across the state. I just listed those. I don't know if you can see them. The purple doesn't show up great. Um, but the idea is that they get public input on these maps um, and hear what the public wants to see in redistricting maps. Um, because oftentimes, the public has one or two things they would like to see in a particular area, but they're not necessarily concerned about other areas in the state. And after the public hearings, we actually got down to proposing maps. Um, anyone can draw maps, even the public. Uh, it is quite a process. I think my predecessor asked that anyone from the public coming in block off three to four hours to make sure that they had time to draw all the different districts <laughs> across the state. Um, it's often the legislators who do draw the maps just because they do go through the, the, the legislative process like any other bill does. Um, the Legislative Research Department helps with physically drawing maps, so legislators or the public, or whoever wants to draw the map, would come into our office and we would sit down with them and help them use the software to create maps electronically. Um, but again, we are nonpartisan, so there's no policy or content input in that. It's just physically helping them draw the map and then doing a technical check to make sure that it's meeting the, <coughs> the laws, the rules that the committee has set up, and then hopefully minimum legal standards. Um, like I said, the maps go through the committee process like any other bill, um, and the public can also participate in the hearing process on the bills. Uh, I 
again, most people have one or two concerns that they want to address and don't want to come in and drop full maps, but that is, that is available. Um, next is, once we draw a map, it goes through the committee process. Um, and I think the rules that they used in 2012 and they're very small. Um, basically, they were looking at, it says that they're going to um, use the federal census that they're going to have them be as numerically as equal in population as possible, that they will neither dilute um, minority voting strength, and that they're going to use precincts as the building blocks, that they're going to be compact and congruous as Congress as possible, um, and they maintain the integrity and priority of the existing political subdivisions. They're not going to break up communities of interest when they can help it, and contests between incumbent members of the legislature and state board of education will be avoided whenever possible. And finally, they want to make sure that they're easily understandable and identifiable by voters. So those were the goals of uh, the Senate committee in 2012. <coughs> so the last step is Kansas Supreme Court approval, which is also required by the Constitution. Um, redistricting bills are published in the Kansas Register immediately upon their passage. And from that date, the Attorney General has 15 days to um, petition the court to determine the validity of the map. The court then has 30 days to issue its judgment. And if the court says it's valid, the process is complete and we're done until the next cycle. Um, uh, if the court says it's invalid, however, we go through a similar process that's a little bit shortened. Um, the AG has uh, 15 days to enter the, to request the ju judgment on validity. The court has 10 days to respond. If the court says it's valid, it's done. If not, we repeat until we end up with maps that are, that are valid. Um, I just was gonna say a brief word about 2012. Uh, as most of you probably know, we did not end up with maps that were drawn by the legislature in 2012. The court ended up drawing those maps. Um, they did not they were not able to pass redistricting maps before they adjourned the 2012 session. And so it actually went to a federal court who drew the lines um, how they wanted to. And the courts have a little bit different standards when they when they draw maps. Um, and Senator Owens, I'm sure, the speaker can tell you more about that. Um, just for more information, and again, my things are not showing up very well, but we have our Kansas Legislative Research Department has a website that has information as it comes up about redistricting. You can find information there. Census Bureau also has information not only on, on the census process, but on the <coughs> redistricting data project. You can find more information there. And just, again, a plug from my office. If you have any other questions, there's more information available just on our website, which is www.kslegresearch.org. So, um, I know that I went over that very fast, it's very high level. It's one of those things where I can talk about it for 15 minutes or I can talk about it for five or six days. <laughs> um, so if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. But. Would you say the website for this? Yeah, it's www.kslegresearch.org. And there are links to all the different um, policy committee topics there. So you can also find who your contact would be if you have a question on the judiciary bill or some other. Yeah. Hello. Okay. Great. Uh, so I guess first of all, gerrymandering. Where did that word even come from? Well, I can tell you, this is a gerrymander. Um, actually, it's so this dates back to the 19th century. Uh, this these were the districts in Massachusetts. Uh, Governor Elbridge Jerry was responsible for these in 1812, and they had this lovely district that some creative artist decided looked like a, a salamander, actually. And somebody saw it and said, that's not a salamander, that's a gerrymander named after the governor. So uh, that's, that's where we get the word then, gerrymander. So now you know. <laughs> he will live on in infamy. Uh, but quite similar, we are here today talking about gerrymandering. So what is gerrymandering? It's redistricting gone wrong, basically. Uh, it's when 
a party or a group of people try to intentionally manipulate the boundaries of a district to either maybe dilute the vote of another of another group of people, as we saw in North Carolina. North Carolina, the Supreme Court ruled this summer that North Carolina District 12 was invalid because the legislature had intentionally tried to dilute the vote of the African American population. Uh, but it can also be not just a, a group, group of minority group, but a political group or any other kind of group of people. Um, and legally, the Supreme Court is trying to figure out, well, is it really illegal? Um, it is in the case of racial minorities, but if it's partisan gerrymandering, is that illegal? And they haven't actually come out with a firm answer yet. Hopefully, we'll find out soon. Um, Wisconsin came before the Supreme Court in October, so we have yet to hear their ruling on that. Um, okay, so next. Uh, in case you're wondering, here's a map of Kansas. Here are your state districts. Uh, as you can see, there's a whole lot of little ones here and a whole lot of little ones up here, geographically small. Big ones out here because there aren't a whole lot of people. Um, but they're roughly the same population in each one of these districts. So you can see why drawing these lines can get really complicated really quickly. So how can it be done fairly? Or if we're interested in gerrymandering, how could it be done unfairly? How can we make it work to our advantage if we're drawing those lines? Well, I'll tell you. Um, so you may have heard these terms packing and cracking when talking about gerrymandering. What does that mean? Uh, well, let's say we're going to simplify things just a little bit here. So let's say we have this red and blue state, okay, and uh, it's, it's a small population state. Let's say each one of these squares is a person. So we have blue people and we have red people. And in this particular state, 60% of the people are blue and 40% of them are red. So when we divide up the districts, you would think, okay, if we divide up the districts in a fair way, 60% of the representatives should be blue and 40% should be red. Well, here's some different ways we could divide it up. We could divide it up in these districts here. It looks really simple. They all look the same size. This looks nice and neat. But if it's divided up this way, blue has the majority in all five of the districts. Okay, so even though blue is only 60% of the population, if the lines are drawn this way, blue wins all of the districts, 100% of the districts. So it might look nice and neat, but it's in a way that uh, helps out blue. Well, you could also draw them a little funny here. Uh, and in this way, red actually has the majority in three of the districts. So even though red is only 40% of the population, they're the majority when it's drawn this way. Option three is to draw them in a, in a way where uh, red would get two, blue would get three. So that's 60% of the representation then, which would make sense. So how was this done? Uh, both of these are gerrymandering. And they both involve packing and cracking. So what red did over here was they said, well, we know that we can't win all of the districts. We only have 40% of the vote. but if we pack as many blue votes as possible into a couple of districts, that's the packing, let's put them all together as much as possible, and then the ones that are left over, we're going to crack them, we're going to split them amongst the other districts to dilute their vote. So we want to make them as powerless as possible, we're going to pack them into as few districts as possible, the ones that are left over then we'll just split them up all the other districts so their vote doesn't count as much. So packing and cracking are the two tools of a professional gerrymanderer. Um, and this is what, this is one of the things we're looking for when we look at, eh, is this gerrymandered? Is this unfair? Is there some packing and cracking going on? And like I said, in North Carolina, they found that sure enough, there was a lot of packing going on in that North Carolina 12 district in an effort to try to dilute the vote of a community of people. Okay, so we're in Kansas, so we're interested in Kansas. What does, the, what does the layout look like in Kansas? Well, first of all, let's look at perfection. So, yeah, this is a graph of percentage of representation versus percentage of the vote. And in a in perfect world, 
if 50% of the people vote for a certain party, then 50% of the representatives should be of that party. If 60% of the vote is of a certain party, then 60% of the representatives should be of that party. Most people will agree, okay, yeah, that seems fair, that seems perfect world. There's no place in this world that is perfect, though. Um, so, but ideally, it should look maybe something like this. Although some people will say, well, I don't even know that I agree that that's perfection. Okay. Here's another possibility, because some people say, well, you know what I really want is more competitive districts. I, I would like some, see some actual competitive races going on there. Well, if that's your ideal, this is more the graph you're looking at. Because if you have a lot of districts that are really competitive, the vote is always really close in a lot of the districts, if one party or another, if the vote starts to swing a little bit toward that party, all of a sudden, a whole lot of really competitive districts are going to be won over by that party. So again, we have at 50%, we still have 50%, but once they start winning a majority of the vote, a bunch of those competitive districts go to that party, all of a sudden, whoo, at 60% of the vote, they have 80% of the representation. So kind of be careful what you ask for. Um, but still, at 50, it's still 50%. And again, we have symmetry on both sides of that. And most people at least can agree that, okay, 50-50 is a good marker, and things should be symmetrical so that both parties have the same consequences when things either go their way or don't go their way. Okay. So let's look at Kansas. Shall we? All right. So this is the reality in Kansas, um, based on the districts I've run the data from two different election cycles. Uh, and there's, this is how it comes up. Um, if 50% of the people in Kansas, uh, this is for state, uh, state representatives that I did this, we only have four districts for US Congress, it's kind of hard to run data for that. I thought the state was more interesting. So if 50% of the people in Kansas voted Republican, then about 55% of the representation would be Republican. So we don't have that 50-50 marker. And you can see the line's kind of steep over on this side, not as steep over here. We don't have symmetry either. Okay. So these are a couple of things that might make you go, hmm, maybe it's not quite as balanced or fair as it could be or should be. The, the reality, where we are right now is at about 60% of the vote. So is Republican, so about uh, I can't remember the exact number, close to 70% of the representation um, is Republican. And so you'll actually see a similar graph like this in several states. It's not always the Republicans that are advantaged. It, you know, whichever uh, party is in power, if their legislature is drawing the lines, guess what? It tends to advantage the party that's in power because um, they draw the lines for that purpose. So. You skip. This is just kind of the flip side of it. 50% voted Democrat, about 45%. The numbers add up to one. All right. Um, Wisconsin. Oh, yes. Skip Wisconsin. Okay. Um, oh, I can talk about Wisconsin real quick. Why is everyone so interested in Wisconsin? Well, what they found is in 2012, 47% of people voted Republican, but 60% of the state seats went to Republicans, so people started to go, huh, that's, that's interesting. Um, in 2016, they did want a majority, but the majority of the seats that they got was much larger. Um, so people started to question this. Like I said, it went to the Supreme Court on October 3rd. We're still waiting to hear. Ooh, what's going to happen? And it turns out Justice Kennedy is the one they're all looking to, because he's the one they're thinking could go either way. And since he could go either way, they really wanted to... Uh, please him or talk to him, a bunch of mathematicians got together and said, you know what, we're going to create an equation just for Justice Kennedy. Uh, they had reason to believe that this would be the equation that would sway him. It's not necessarily, from a mathematical standpoint, the best equation, but they thought it would be the easiest to understand and the one that Kennedy would be the most open to listening to. And so you might have heard this term efficiency gap thrown around a lot recently. What is the efficiency gap? So the way this is measured, it really is a fairly simple formula. So you look at each district, and in a district, if that party won the district, 
anything over 50% of the vote is considered a wasted vote, or 50% plus one vote. Um, anything above that is a wasted vote, it was unneeded. If a party lost the district, then all the votes are considered wasted votes. Now, I, you know, you're an organization that really promotes voting, so no voted is a wasted vote. <laughs> um, but they mean the terminology a little bit differently. Mathematically, it's, it's wasted. And ideally, both parties would have the same number of wasted votes statewide. So they find the difference between the two parties' wasted votes and divide it by the total number of votes. Come up with a percentage, and that's the efficiency gap. Now, in perfect world, it would be 0%. Both parties have the same number of wasted votes. Now, even if the lines are drawn to a way that we think is perfect, there is no such thing as perfection. We're never going to achieve that 0%. So what is considered acceptable? Of course, there's going to be disagreement on that, but the general consensus on what's acceptable. Well, on average, when they ran this across states, on average, the efficiency gap was about 4%. Okay, so most mathematicians said, you know, Anything in that range or below is probably acceptable. If we get above 4%, then we start to look at it and go, yeah, maybe things aren't right. Um, in Wisconsin, I don't have it up here, Wisconsin is at 13%. So, and they said anything above 8%, we're really going to start to say that's, that's not good. There's something unfair going on. Uh, they didn't run the numbers for Kansas, I think probably because it's so small. But I ran the numbers for Kansas. Um, when I ran the numbers based on the U.S. districts, I came up with 25%. I wouldn't, I wouldn't put a lot of stake in that, though, because like I said, we only have four districts. Uh, so the fewer districts there are, the less accurate your number's going to be. They actually only ran the numbers that I could find for states that had six or more U.S. districts. Because we're not big enough to care about. But, but what I found more interesting was the state districts, because... We have 125 of those, right? Yes. <laughs> so the numbers will be a lot more accurate with that many going into it. And so I ran the efficiency gap for both the 2016 and 2014 elections. Uh, 2014, it came up with 15%, and in 2016, that was a different kind of election cycle, wasn't it? 8%, yeah. um, <laughs> both numbers above that 8% mark, um, where we really are concerned that there might be something unfair going on here. Okay. Uh, so the question is, what, well, what can we do about it? And I love that you spoke to ways that the public can get involved and actually have a voice in it. I don't know if that's been used as much as it could, could be. So there was ways to do that. And fortunately, because the mathematicians are really stepping things up, we have some easier ways for the public to get involved. There's this great movement going on, public map, publicmapping.org um, are really creating a movement where the public can create their own maps. They've created this open source software. They're going to plug in that census data from the 2020 census as soon as it's available. And you can actually, or you get together with some of your closest friends that have a free Friday night <laughs> <laughs> and draw up a districting plan for your state. And it'll tell you, it'll make sure that it follows all the guidelines. It'll give you feedback on lots of different metrics that it measures, how fair is it? We could create, really could create thousands of maps to give to the legislature and say, hey, here's some ideas, here's some things, and they follow all these standards, and here's why we like them. Um, and if, if, if they go off the deep end with something crazy, we have a record to say, hey, you know what? They have all these fair options. And here's why the option they went with maybe wasn't as fair. Although ideally, we throw all these fair options out there and they go, you know what, okay, yeah, we're gonna go with one of these or something that's really similar to one of those. So I think we really need to take advantage of the opportunities to have a voice as the public. Um, so this is what we'd like to see in a fair districting plan. Wow. Well, are there any questions? <laughs> You know, uh, Confucius said, and you've all heard this before, that uh, maybe we live in interesting times, and they weren't really sure whether he was talking about a curse or a blessing. But 
Well, I felt that same way the day that uh, President Steve Morris told me that I was going to chair the redistricting or reapportionment committee for the Senate. And I thought, oh my, why isn't somebody else who's been here longer than me going to do this? Well, I justified it with this. I was the chair of the Judiciary Committee, and this was the, something that dealt with the law. So I thought, well, okay, that's why they're going to have me do this. I've heard some amazing things here. I wish I'd have had those statistical uh, items when we were doing it, because it probably would have helped me with my discussion with the committee that I had. But my job is to fill in the gaps of what the real people thing is with dealing with how you redistrict. And the real people thing is all those elected people that you send to Topeka to figure out how to do some of these things. So uh, let me start with what, how I started. Once I got assigned this job in 2011, I wrote a letter to my fellow senators, and I don't usually in, in talks like this, especially with the intellectual capacity that's in a room like this one. I don't usually read, but I'm going to read the letter that I wrote to my fellow senators at the beginning of that process. Keep in mind what you saw up here, and then this is, is this kind of follows along with some of the rules we were supposed to follow. Fellow senators, over the past few months, the redistricting committee has hosted public hearings in 14 communities across the state. During this phase of the process, we heard from a number of citizens and community leaders about their ideas and preferences for a new Senate, House, and congressional boundary lines. With this first phase completed, we are moving into phase two of the process and preparing for our committee work. Now keep in mind, the committee had already gone around the state in these 14 different places just to listen to what people had to say about what they wanted with regard to redistricting. I need to hear from you, and I emphasize that. Your ideas and input are important at this stage of the process so that the committee can work from the feedback provided by both the public and from each senator. Though changes are inevitable in this process, my priority as chairman is to create legally sound Senate and congressional maps that accomplish the following. One, meet the population requirements for the ideal district. Now, at that time, the ideal district in the Senate was approximately 70,000 people. Two, do not contain gerrymandered districts. And three, address the needs and preferences of our sitting senators to the best of our ability within the confines of items one and two above. <coughs> I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. The committee will resume meetings in January once the legislative session resumes. I am shooting, the meeting, sh shooting for meetings of the committee on each Friday afternoon about 1 p.m. Now that's scary in the legislature because so many people want to go home on Friday afternoon. <laughs> beginning the first Friday after we return until our work is done, so that I may prepare notes and a possible template map to work from for the committee, I ask that you contact me before December 19th. You may reach me at, and I gave my phone numbers, both home and cell, or at my uh, T. Owens 10 address, so that we may discuss your district and your ideas. If you want to meet in person, call me and we will find a way to set up a time to do that. I appreciate your candid comments and willingness to have an open dialogue as we continue through the redistricting process. I felt, and so did the chair of the House at the time, that we needed to have as open and transparent a process as we could. And I was very, very insistent that we follow the rule of law. I'm a lawyer. <laughs> And I also chaired the Judiciary Committee, and I thought, well, you know, we need to follow these rules. We can't be deviating from them just for, for some political purpose. But, of course, I was talking to politicians. <laughs> As we went around the state, uh, not everybody attended those meetings, but if they were from that particular district in those 14 areas, 
we had a pretty good turnout. One of the largest was in Pittsburgh. We had some, a large one out in Garden City. We went all over the state, and we listened to what people had to say. Most people were pretty concerned about finite kinds of things. They weren't thinking in terms of the broad brush. They were thinking about how does it affect me, my district, or my representation. Now the committee that I had was made up of 13 people. I had four Democrats because they, they, they assigned committees according to the population of the house that you're in. And we had eight senators that were Democrats at the time. So each committee had a, a very small number of Democrats on the committee. And that included the redistricting committee. So out of the 13 members, we had nine Republicans and four Democrats. Of those nine Republicans, we had approximately four conservatives and five moderates. And you think we started just recently with this mess? <laughs> Let me tell you, it was beginning a long time ago. And that committee was probably a, an example of how it can go. When we began with the map drawing that you heard about, and by the way, if any of you are thinking about those Friday night parties that you're going to throw, <laughs> please don't invite me. <laughs> you would be amazed at what goes on. I, I actually saw 36 maps myself when we were working with the research department, and they are great at what they do. Believe me, it's a great group of people, very, very bright people that know a lot about how to do, do this sort of thing. But there were a lot of people going down there to draw maps, and there were a lot of long hours that those folks put in to draw the maps. Unfortunately, I am technologically challenged, so I, my, my thumb drive didn't include this, I'm sure you can all see this. <laughs> this is one of my maps. This is Sunflower 9A. We named all the maps. And there were so many maps uh, that uh, beyond even the 36 that uh, we had to number them and name them. So let me talk a little bit about, first of all, about gerrymandering and whether or not we had any of that that went on in our process. Unfortunately, we did. Now, nobody wanted to call it that. But let me give you the example that I, I use the most because we are sitting in the middle of the third district right now out of the four districts that Kansas has. And this was probably the district that had the most egregious of gerrymandering of any of them. And I'll tell you how. My philosophy of drawing the maps was to make them as square as you could. I'm old military. I like, you know, little boxes and have everything look really neat and tidy. And I had, had a map that really did that. And it was numerically sound. Well, the third district, when I drew it, had Windout and Johnson County. Now, prior to this time, it included Douglas County. But because of the numbers, they took Douglas County out of it completely. So we now have Windout in Johnson County. Think about the, the uh, <laughs> demographics of those two counties. I had a little piece of, in order to make the numbers work, I had a little piece of Leavenworth County that was very nicely contiguous to Wyandotte County, and it attached very well, had nice boundaries, and that was what I proposed. That was what Sunflower 9A was. The Republicans, and particularly the, the more conservative group, went haywire with that. Why? Why do you think they'd be upset about that? Because that little piece of Leavenworth County was more populated with Democrats. And they didn't want to add that, even though they lost Douglas County, which was also more heavily with Democrats. Not majority, but they were still heavily. So they insisted that we change that boundary and they cut out a piece of Miami County instead of the piece of Leavenworth County. Why? 
because Miami County is a lot more conservative and it has a lot more Republicans. Now, I don't know what your definition looks like of gerrymandering, but that to me was a gerrymandered position. It was, however, upheld by the court. And it was what went through. So that's what we have today. So that's an example for you of what what can happen, and it happened in our committee. Now, as we were doing the committee, as I was chairing the committee, one of the difficulties I had was, of course, I had four Democrats, four conservative Republicans, and five moderate Republicans, including me. And every time we'd have a meeting, we, we had a difficulty getting any kind of a vote out. It was going to either be Republicans and Democrats together, or all the Republicans together. There were times when we just canceled the meeting. There were times when leadership said, wait a minute, we don't have this put together very well yet, so we're going to have to just slow it down a little bit. Well, that's the way the politics of this thing gets in the way of the statistical data that you've heard and how statistics can really make things look very, very tidy, very neat, very clean, and probably the way we ought to be looking at it, because the way that the original founders of the Constitution meant was we want to have numbers that are fair and evenly distributed so that every vote is counted toward the final analysis. <coughs> The people in the state of Kansas were more worried about who was going to get put together in the re-election campaign with the redistricting. We had uh, a number of places where the Democrats were really concerned that we were going to put a strong Republican against them in order to defeat them. I think about that from the Senate standpoint. We only had eight Democrats in the Senate out of 40. But they were still very, very concerned that they, they didn't want to lose any more of the eight that they had. But the conservative wing of the Republican Party, and I, I mean that very sincerely, it wasn't everybody who was a Republican. The conservative wing was very adamant that we take those Democrats out. And so when they had the discussions, they were talking about what can we do to put two people together, one Democrat, one Republican, in a district. I remember what I said in the letter that I, I wanted to be sure that we addressed the needs and preferences of the sitting senators to the best of our ability. The nicest thing to do would probably have been to just leave everybody alone and not have any caring done. The reality was we had to pair, because the numbers just wouldn't allow us not to. What we ended up with was pairing, and we got it, two conservative Republicans in three of the districts, which, you know, that just wasn't going to go over with the committee. And in addition to our committee looking at it, we had to send it over to the other house, and they had to send theirs over to us. They didn't like that either. So those pairings became part of the problem that we had in getting to a conclusion that everybody could send on to the governor and could send on and pass the bill. But they didn't like the pairings. So when we got down to it, we didn't get a vote out of the legislature to confirm before we were due to go home. We went home without passing the bill. And yet, it had to be done that year. So what happened was it went to the court. I told you I'm a lawyer. I've done everything in the courtroom except be the court reporter. <laughs> but I'll tell you, the toughest job in the world is being the witness. I spent three hours on the stand in the federal district court on the redistricting hearings. We had 36 lawyers representing 36 different entities wanting to have a say in the courtroom and ask me questions. 
I answered them to the best of my ability. The court was very nice to me. They treated me very well, the three panel uh, district court. And in the end result, they took the, they took the maps. But they also took the uh, person who was given the responsibility in the, in the uh, where department? The, what? the research department. <laughs> And he was the advisor to the court in looking at all these maps because then all of a sudden the court had all of this handed off to them. And they redrew the maps. And the districts that we have today are what the court drew. Now, I can tell you from a personal standpoint, you know, like I can say, now my shoulders are two inches lower than they used to be because I got defeated. That's a good thing. Not that I got defeated, but my shoulders are lower. <laughs> the reality was that in my district, here in Johnson County, what that amounted to is I lost 60% of my district. When you lose 60% of your district, and that moves to a different dynamic, you know, it makes it tough to win re-election. So, you know, if that's the reason, that's the reason, you know. Everybody looks for reasons for things happening. But that was one, one example. Now, I wanted to tell you another little story, just, just because it's fun, <laughs> about the numbers and how we looked at numbers and how these, these boundaries mean something. My wife and I were driving down to my old hometown of Newton, Kansas. And we actually are, was on our way back. And as we drove by Peabody, Kansas, everybody know where Peabody, Kansas is? It's on Highway 50. And we, we drove by Peabody, Kansas. And I told her, I said, see, see that house over there? It was out kind of away from the city. I said, see that house? Yeah. Two people lived there. I said, how do you know that? <laughs> chair of the committee. <laughs> well, in reality, I did know that because that house was just outside the city limits, but it was the only house there. And everybody else in Peabody was going to be in a different district than those two people. <laughs> so when we drew the district, we drew it to include those two people in the district with the people that lived there. Anyway, it was a fascinating experience. It was, I, I can't say it was always enjoyable, but I really learned a lot. And again, uh, I, I think it's something that you should look into more and more as to how it's done because it does affect you, no matter where you live. Thank you again for letting me come and speak to one of my favorite groups and for letting me share the podium with such bright people as this. To open the floor to Q and A now. So, okay, who's got it? I have a question. When you're talking about the votes, uh, when you do your numbers, do you use the number of registered voters or the number of people that actually vote in any given election? When I came up with the efficiency gap numbers, I took the actual numbers of people who voted. So I looked at um, the voting records from 2016 and 2014. How many people voted for Democrat? How many people voted for Republican? How many voted for some other party? And added all those up uh, for each district. Um, okay. um, I heard uh, science in this, and how is that affecting the redistricting? 
Thank you for asking that question. <laughs> Gobbledygook, one of, one of my favorites. I'm putting that up there. Um, yeah. Math, for some reason, has gone down in favor uh, in, the, in recent years, which is really unfortunate. Um, and people are really quick to dismiss it. Oh, I just don't understand it without taking the time to try to understand it. Now, I think probably he actually understood it. Um, but for him to say something like that almost gives permission to the rest of the country to say, oh, yeah, it's called, I can't understand it, just blah, 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 whatever. Um, which is, again, really unfortunate because the science and the math can help us to make life better, I think, and life more fair. So uh, my reaction is, gosh darn it, why did you have to say something like that? Uh, but as, as, a, as an educator, then that just increases my motivation then to gather and say, you know what, you can understand it. Uh, if you can read, you can understand the math. You really can. Um, and to continue to promote education, to tell my students, you know, you need to understand college algebra if you don't want to. Uh, because you never know when you're going to be in a courtroom, maybe as a justice, and you need to understand uh, what they're talking about. Um, but we all need a certain level of literacy and a certain level of acceptance that, that Math isn't everything, it's, and, and we can't understand it, and we need to make the effort to understand what's, what's going on, um, and not to just dismiss it out of hand because we don't want to. I don't know if this is going to be a math question for you or not. What's the variance allowed within the districts? Is that a raw number or percentage that's used? For efficiency gap? I used raw number, raw data. What about the uh, districts themselves with raw numbers? You mentioned 70,000 approximately or something like that. What, what's the variation in pure numbers that you allowed on that? Well, I can, t I can tell you from one of the, uh, from the math that I drew that the deviation in, in the four districts, the four uh, federal districts, uh, the population was approximately 71,000 in each of those districts. Uh, the deviation was, in the, in the fourth district, was 0.05%. Uh, in the third district, it was 0%. In the second district, it was 0.74%. And in the first district, it was 0.78%. <coughs> so they were... Uh, the, the uh, population densities were all within a range of, the lowest was 708,032, the highest was 712,939. So we got them down to really, really narrow percentage deviation because the courts, more often in the federal area, they're going to be really, really particular about it, and they don't get too much into the state as much because they leave it up to the state to be able to figure out what they need to do, as long as it isn't gerrymandering on, on some other area. But the deviations, the research department did a great job in, in making sure that we held pretty close to those deviations. I, I will just say, uh, case law has said across the country, it's maybe changing as we hear, hear some decisions coming down, that plus or minus 10% is kind of the threshold, and that's not always true. Uh, the legislature last time said they wanted to do no more than plus or minus 5% in their districts. Um, the maps that had the most success in the legislature and didn't pass were plus or minus 3%, and the court drew them to plus or minus 1%. So that's where we are with the state uh, district. Hi, my name is Chris Roselle. I trained in gobbledygook, <laughs> a master's in nutrition, a master's in public health, BS in chemistry and zoology, all but the dissertation in management. That's gobbledygook. That's the stuff that sending astronauts to the moon was based on. That's the stuff that they want me to ask a question. A, there are at least three issues here, and I'd like to know your recommendation for the redistricting, but one of the issues is 
that 18 year old, 18 to 25 year old voter participation in Kansas dropped 18 percent in the last four years. And that affects our redistricting. That affects who turns out and who votes. The next is that people don't vote. And the next, and that's possibly because of the system. But what are your recommendations for us to, how can we be involved in a way that makes it so that the redistricting represents the population's interest and supposedly us getting people who represent us rather than represent something else? What's your recommendation? <coughs> You might break that down one at a time. Let's take the 18 to 25 year old vote. Uh, which I, is very unfortunate, and that's uh, um, who I teach, actually. So the best I can do is give a big guilt trip every time there's an election coming up. Um, we do sit down in my classroom and say, do you know your polling place? No? Okay, let's pull it up before we do linear equations today. We're going to talk about where you're going to go vote tomorrow. Um, but there does need to be more effort to reaching that population. Uh, as far as what can we do, the census is of utmost importance. This next census coming up. Um, it makes sure that everyone is counted. That's the, really the big first step that needs to happen. Um, so anything that, that you as an organization can do to make sure that the census <coughs> is successful. Uh, because if there's entire populations that are not counted, they will not be represented. And when the redistricting happens, they won't they won't be counted in that, uh, which is a huge disadvantage, can be a huge disadvantage to, to certain populations. Uh, I also teach uh, state and local government, if you believe, at Johnson County Community College, and I, I will tell you that I start every class with requiring them to find out who their representatives are, from the president on down to their city council. And uh, we try to get the word out to all of the political science and government classes, and ask them to find those kinds of information out, but also urge them to vote. And, and we're kind of preaching to the choir here, but we have got to get people to understand it's important to vote, because if you don't vote, you voted. Especially when you've got a constituency like what we have now, where, in my opinion, and I, I will label it as that, we have more extremists who do turn out to vote but the broad base middle is afraid to vote or they don't think it counts or don't think it matters. We have to teach everybody, whether they're 18 to 25 or more close to my age, you've got to teach everybody it, it is important to vote because if you don't vote, you've already voted. That, it's get the word out. Hi, the question I have is I noticed that the governor could veto the plans, and I want to ask, does that happen often? And when it happens, what does what happens after they veto it? I, I, I have not been with the department. I've only been there since 2012, so the last cycle was the first I've ever gotten to see. So Senator Owens may have some more insight into this. I don't know that it happens all that often. I don't think it's ever been vetoed. Yeah. But... If the governor did veto it, it would send it back to the legislature and probably in a special session. And they would have to deal with it and send it back to the governor. My guess is that most governors would not want to wade into that. They might let it become law without their signature if they really didn't agree with it. But it's a political, you know, lightning storm if, if the governor gets into it. I don't think that that it'd have to be really egregious, I think, for any governor to be uh, willing to get into that. Hi, uh, this is probably boring to most of us, but maybe not to Joanna and me. I've been worrying about census data for practically my entire professional career, and just historically, it's been 100% census. As I recall, one or two rounds ago, there was some attempt to save money at the federal level by using a sample rather than the full census. Uh, what 
But how has that ended up? And if it is now a sample-based system, how, how does that skew with your ability to get down to the block level and really know <coughs> what's there? <clears throat> Obviously, the the more information we have, the the better the whole process goes. Um, I know they they do do some sampling. I, I think I can say without wading into anything political that you all have heard about the budget cuts um, for the census coming up um, and how they're they're trying some new tactics like um, letting people return their information online and things like that that haven't been tested before. Um. <laughs> Again, I'm a nonpartisan staff, so my opinion and thoughts on this aren't really, my, my bosses would tell you they're not relevant. <laughs> but um, I would just say that the more information we can have, the more full information we can have, the better off we are when we go into that process. And if I might add to Joanna's response, some of you know that I'm a, a mayor of a tiny town here in Johnson County. And your cities have been approached by the Census Bureau. And if your cities are not actively participating in returning the data being requested, then people will not be counted. So go ask your city council, what are y'all doing about the census? Have you responded? Are you being active? Because that's a critical step, too. Jody, you've got questions back. I think we've got two more questions back here. That would be required. I, I was going to speak about the census as well. The uh, head of the Census Bureau resigned in May. Currently, there is no head of the Census Bureau. It's in somewhat disarray. There's speculation that they'll even use the 2010 census with pledge factors to update it to 2020 even though uh, every 10-year count of the population is mandated by uh, the Constitution. So I agree this is something to keep an eye on. Uh, Judge, my other point is that this administration, uh, it's, an, it's an open question uh, what type of condition, what type of census we'll have in 2020. And of course, that's key to our democracy. Okay. Um, in some states, they have a bipartisan or nonpartisan um, set up for, for doing this and takes it away from the legislative, le legislature. It, is that at all reasonable to do within Kansas? <laughs> <laughs> They all look at me. <laughs> you know, uh, I think that's a great question, Lee, but I, I think that you will probably not get that sort of thing in a, in a state that is as heavily red as this state is, and if it was heavily blue, it would be the same thing. Uh, I just don't see that happening. Now, would it be reasonable, having been a chair of the committee and seen what we dealt with with regard to the political aspects of it that got in, in, into the into the numbers, then it might make a lot more sense to do that. But then there's the other argument, and we heard this argument from people, and that is we elected people to represent our interests. And they expect those elected people to do that, and that is in the legislature. So I'm not sure that everybody in the state would really agree that going to a totally nonpartisan numerical group would be what they want to have because I don't think they would feel like their voice is there. Uh, I will just add, there was a um, House resolution introduced this last session that would have proposed a nonpartisan redistricting commission, um, and that was Representative Parker, I think. Um, and it's still alive. It, they carry over for the biennium. So, there is still a legislation out there. It's a resolution because it would require a constitutional amendment, but um, that is still alive. 
Is there one last question? We're fast approaching the witching hour here when we like to try to wrap this meeting up and have any announcements, if there are any. I have a few announcements. Uh, first of all, I want to thank our guests. It was really 